we're doing a little bit different. We're, cha we're turning our attention where it's often been on the bees themselves and researchers studying bees to researchers who are also authors and who study the people who keep bees as much as they study the bees. So uh, our first speaker is Eleanor Snow Andrews and Ellie just got her PhD last year at Cornell and she will be talking about uh, uh, the sociology of sustainable beekeeping. The second speaker will be Tammy Horn Potter, who is the Kentucky apiculturist, has several books under her belt, and a new one that's coming out that I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit about. And she'll talk uh, as a second speaker about uh, bees and the history of beekeeping in the USA. And our moderator for this evening is Dr. David Tarpey from North, North Carolina. State University, um, who knows both of these speakers quite well. And so we, we, we essentially ask him to do the moderations. Um, the uh, one quick note as in this webinar format, we ask the attendees to use chat for if you've got a problem, you can't log in, or you just want to say howdy to a friend and so on, use the chat function for that. But for questions to be addressed to the speakers, please use the question and answer. And David will use the question and answer that you post to uh, derive the questions that he will direct to the speakers. One other thing, those of us who are panelists cannot access the Q&A, that's just a Zoom thing. Only the, the webinar attendees can. I guess Zoom figures that we have access to microphones and can speak so that we don't need to, to use the Q&A. Um, so, um, this evening is being sponsored by the Bee Health Guru app, and just to be clear, I wear several hats. I'm a semi-retired professor at the University of Montana, the lead instructor on their online master beekeeping program. I also have a small private company that is actually where we've developed this Bee Health Guru app. And I am the president of the Western Apricultural Society. So the, tonight I'm, I'm here as both to moderate and, and introduce the session, but right between Ellie and Tammy, I'll be making a pitch for, tell you a little bit about the app we've been working on for almost a decade now. So uh, Ellie, are you ready to go? I sure am. All righty, I'll turn it over to you then, Ellie. All right, uh, let me share the screen here. Is that in full um, for you? Looks it's good. Fine. Great. Um, so great, as Jerry said, my name is Ellie and I'll introduce myself a little bit here. So I've been beekeeping for about 10 years now. Um, it does keep ticking up, although I know the collective um, amount in the room is, is certainly much higher than that. Um, and as he said, I just um, finished at Cornell in the sociology, development sociology department. And so what that means is that we study the kind of social processes when economic develop ha development happens both around the world and, and here in the US. And so for me in particular, I'm interested in environmental politics, kind of sustainability issues. And so I got into studying politics and kind of the people behind the bees, um, thinking about the way that they do or don't define or share values differently, the ways that information literacy is kind of all tied up in how we navigate, um, you know, YouTube plus the magazines plus the thing that our old neighbor told us. He's Cornell, and then I tell you what to do. Does that make you trust me more or less? I'm never quite sure. Um, and, and, and broadly, again, that history of extension, which kind of relates to all those things. And so um, this is the picture of me again. I'm a member of the Eastern Apicultural Society, all of us here on the East Coast. Um, so this is me during, during our drone spitting Olympics um, some years ago. My drone did not um, get very far, I'm afraid. Um, anyway, I've been involved in a bunch of things at Cornell and publishing mostly scholarly stuff. I had one in bee culture about information literacy. And so I got involved in this topic because I was interested in environmental politics writ large, um, again, in the US, um, and I had already been keeping bees. And so I was surprised, and perhaps I shouldn't have been at first, by how political and kind of polarized it seemed. Again, this is me coming in in 2010, when I think there was much, there was a, a much more interest than there seems to be now. I mean, I think, I think some of that initial or that some of that fuss when I started 
um, has has um, calmed down a bit um, in terms of just the numbers of new attendees at, at bee clubs. Um, and, and, and so I think beekeeping, as my, all of you probably know, it's difficult to learn to do well. It's, it depends so much on the things you do, but also things out of your control. But to have this extra layer of politics on top of the learning, I just thought was a really interesting kind of fruitful place to start. And so as I began to ask these questions, that I, these kind of broad themes that I brought up, I ended up going much further back in time than I, than I had anticipated when I began my dissertation. And so this um, figure broadly is probably familiar to many of you. I'm not going to give you the whole history of bee space, but briefly, of course, there's this invention. What is it? 1850s here. Lorenzo Langstroth gives us this kind of new modern hive, and it's not exactly... Uh, it takes a while for um, uh, it to be adopted. If I had my notes, I could remember, but in something like uh, the 1870s, I have some statistic, like only two out of 19 people in one little survey had it. 40, 40 odd years later, the US government estimates that it's something like two thirds of people are using that hive. So after the turn of the century, um, but it's still, you know, it's a slow process. And that, but that process is, um, the adoption of this hive um, comes along with a lot of other adoptions, the honey extractor, smokers, um, all these other pieces that really together um, are the sort of cradle of, of, of modern beekeeping as we know it. Um, oh, it's kind of a, strangely, I don't know why there's two pictures there, just the one on top is all you need. Um, and so again, I know most of the audience here tonight is in the Western, or by, de by definition, you're in the Western Agricultural Society. But because we're talking mid 19th century to start, uh, and it's to the turn of the century, most of what's happening is here in the East and, and specifically in New York, uh, New York State. Um, and so New York State is the epicenter in many ways of beekeeping. Um, in uh, again mid kind of mid 1800s through about the turn of the century and perhaps a little beyond and that's due to a couple of reasons one is the erie canal which had gone in some decades earlier but it meant that the kind of access to the market in new york city um was really um the market was very accessible and um, new york was such a big market that it was really setting the prices for honey um at a, for, for a, a very wide region um, the amount of buckwheat that was growing in New York State at the time was really huge, um, that we don't see it nearly so much now, um, and mostly as kind of Eastern European immigrants kind of assimilated, but at the time, this was a major buckwheat growing area, and you can see in that some of my images are a little fuzzy just because they're old historical ones, um, pulled out from old magazines, but, um, you can see that New York is at the top there, um, and so the, you know, that's not the only thing, but there's just kind of abundant crops on the landscape that make honey production um, uh, um, easier. And so altogether, this is a, a, an article written by a friend and colleague and relatively near neighbor of mine, Peter Borst, some of you may know. Um, altogether, the golden age of beekeeping, it has been argued anyway, was, was kind of that, that second half of the 1800s. And it was happening right here for me right here in upstate New York. Um, and so apiaries go from being, again, a kind of um, mixed, um, mixed in with other kinds of farming endeavors to being standalone businesses. Um, I think I have a picture of the first man who's credited with being sort of a full-time commercial beekeeper, Moses Quinby, um, whose name you might be familiar with. The apiaries, of course, get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so that one is, I forget if this one's, that one's Del Delanson maybe, New York, and I don't remember where this one is, probably a little further east, um, kind of closer to the um, Hudson River, but anyway, big, big numbers um, and sort of exploding in a, in a really big way. Um, so here are three of the men, again, who you might um, be familiar with. Again, Moses Quimby is most famous. They're kind of roughly in chronological, I guess. Uh, Moses Quimby, again, famous for the smoker. Um, um, but also invented, I think, the first pollen substitute and, um, oh, something else. I should have my notes in front of me. But um, uh, Doolittle, who's, of course, now known for um, his queen rearing um, and um, the books that he wrote and the kind of advice um, that he gave publicly. Um, and then the guy on the right is less well known to um, beekeeper historians who aren't kind of more uh, local or regional in the area, but his name is um, uh, 
Lamar Cogshaw. Uh, and so he was one of the first beekeepers um, sort of credited with this more, for lack of a better word, um, kind of industrial style, or kind of just um, large scale, fast, efficient kind of beekeeping. He might have been the first guy also to have the invention of having out yards. Uh, and so you don't have it all right in your backyard um, as you're um, as you're keeping these bees. I had this quote here. Um, Ernest Root has called um, Cogshaw's method the lightning quick slap bang get there plan. Um, so he was the one who popularized the kind of a, a quick, quick and dirty honey extraction. Um, one other guy who's not pictured here is Captain John Hetherington, um, who in the, around the time of the Civil War, so I'm, I'm being a little fast and loose with um, some time eras here, but he was um, the most extensive beekeeper probably in the world. Um, with colonies kind of all up and down the East Coast. Um, and then it was only again bested by Cogshaw when, when um, Hetherington died at, at about the turn of the century. Um, and so um, Cogshaw's hives were in Tompkins County, which is where Cornell is now and would have begun to be by then, by the 1860s or 70s. Um, and that was the number one honey producing county in the, in the um, country and, and by extension, perhaps the world as well. So this is kind of where it's happening. I mean, this New York State is sort of where um, uh, yeah, again, it's the epicenter of, of beekeeping. And so that's why the New York State was also the epicenter of um, foul brood. And um, for, so the very innovations that were sort of advancing beekeeping um, also aggravated kind of existing problems, mostly about just the, again, just the huge numbers of colonies, those, those crowded apiaries. Um, new practices that are associated with managing um, Langstroth styles of hives. Um, there's lots of different styles with just that kind of reuse of comb from year to year, things like that. And so while Falbrood had been around for a while, it really starts to take off um, again, the mid kind of mid 1800s it, it, again, um, commensurate with the growth in the beekeeping industry. Um, and really again, wiped out some apiaries, um, honey production went down from about 1890 to 1910. There's a great article by um, Dennis Van Engelsdorp um, that attributes some of that to the foul brood um, across the country. Um, and let's see, yeah. Um, and that uh, foul brood for a time was called New York bee disease um, because this is, um, as we were still kind of working out what it was, um, different varieties, American, European, um, some of that science was still being worked out. Um, but it, um, again, was so prevalent in New York that that's what it was called um, uh, for a time anyway. And so, I'm moving through a lot of history very quickly here. And again, partly just to give a little background for some of the more contemporary comments and partly just because to get through a lot, but um, so I'm, again, I'll be happy to take questions when it's time. Um, the, um, you know, responses to Falbrood and kind of the ways that the industry sought to manage it um, in those years then um, were, you know, kind of myriad. There were some laws that were passed and I'll talk more about them. Obviously, lots more science was underway in this. Um, Franklin White did a lot of work. I think Moore was maybe his advisor. Um, a lot of stuff was happening at Cornell. Um, again, Cornell is an early land grant institution. It's not the only one, but um, it has a, very, a pretty central role in extension and kind of other education things. And these are all these kind of different ways that, um, that together constituted institutions of New York State Bee Law. Um, Beekeepers Association asked um, our governor, Teddy Roosevelt, to um, pass it in uh, 1899. And so it was passed. Um, and it still has, I think it's been amended, but it's still effectively on the books. Um, we are looking to um, um, like sort of update it for um, the current challenges, of course. Um, and so you might be familiar with this, of course, but so there were, you know, inspector, the inspector program begins or something like, by 1920, there's 16 men um, who are going around the New York State countryside to look for it. Um, they, if they were found to be infected, they could be burned. Um, if you didn't cooperate, you could be fined or go to jail. Um, some of these laws were a little bit stronger at first, and then there was kind of a bit of a backup or backing up from um, too strict of a law, just because that it, um, it was problematic and there was so much of the disease that um, there were a lot of hives being destroyed. So in the end, many fewer actually were 
Um, and at the same time, again, there's some of these, some of the sociology, some of this is already sociology, of course, but the politics begin to creep up. I don't have a quote here exactly, but beekeepers at the time began to grumble that the, um, the inspectors themselves were probably bringing it from place to place if they weren't doing kind of proper disinfection. And um, oh no, I do have a quote here. It said, um, you know, that, that, um, that they, you know, they weren't changing their clothes maybe between visits to different apiaries. And so um, they were suspicious that it would be some time before the foul brood inspector would find his occupation gone for want of hives requ um, requiring to be inspected. I mean, they kept themselves arguably, or there was suspicions they were keeping themselves in the job by spreading the disease as they did this work. Um, the, um, again, the government was involved. It's kind of a grainy photo, but I love it because it's kind of this like government spook in front of these hives in DC. Um, so the, um, you know, the US government sets aside money uh, for beekeeping research, again, as early as the 1880s um, and, and kind of different programs over time, publications and research. Um, the early work by the Bureau of Entomology at the USDA was largely focused on disease. Uh, and again, they send, they send extension officers to different states and New York got some personnel um, by the 19 teens. Um, I think the war changed some things. The first order of business of that, um, that initial um, pers um, person, George Ray, was to um, write a letter to, <clears throat> excuse me, was to write a letter to beekeepers about the control of foul brood. Um, and then again, the big name that some of you may be familiar with if you've ever delved into beekeeping history um, is um, Everett, Everett Franklin Phillips. Um, and so he was at the Bureau of Entomology at the USDA for 20 odd years. And then Cornell kind of poached him um, in the twenties, I think. Um, to get him to run the program here at Cornell. And so he did, you know, his career was really superlative, um, sort of like maybe Mr. Tar Dr. Tarpey's um, in um, education and research and um, all kinds of things. Um, and so this is where I think it gets more interesting in some of these politics around the disease issue. And so by this time, we now have a class of professionals that, you know, heretofore hadn't existed because nobody was a professional beekeeper. But by the time he's in here in the late 20s or so, there's begin, there begins to be kind of different ways of approaching beekeeping. Um, some people who do it for a living and some people who kind of do it for fun. Um, and there's lots of gradations between that. Maybe a spectrum is a better way sometimes to think of it, but nonetheless, there's so these two classes of beekeepers. And so, um, Phillips has this book. The very first section is all about these two classes of beekeepers. Um, and for him, um, this, this question of disease is really, um, is really a key dividing line. And so he says, um, it is increasingly desirable that commercial honey production be carried on by experts. And for him, he, his reasoning is that these smaller hobbyists um, don't have the kind of incentives, financial incentives or expertise to really address these contagious diseases like foul brood. So this is, a, I'm breaking a cardinal rule in PowerPoints here, which is not to throw a whole wall of text at you, but I haven't done it yet, so I feel okay. I might pause and can skim quickly, but I'll pause and then I'll kind of resume. And so briefly here, he's saying again, there's an objection to these small beekeepers who are kind of by, by, by analogy here, not very deeply engaged because they can't become um, proficient. It's no big deal, except we have contagious disease in, in a given region, in this region now, of course. Um, and there's so many unqualified beekeepers in this area that the expert now is getting affected by it. Um, they're letting their, you know, their foul brood get out of control um, and the, um, and the expert again is having his livelihood um, compromised by that. And so, yeah, the negligent beekeeper has this disease property, he constitutes uh, a nuisance and a menace but to the progressive, the progressive beekeeper um, and so on. Let's see, I don't think I have more to say about that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah, and so everybody has to be a good neighbor. Now, if you've been keeping bees for the last X number of years, some of this language or some of these attitudes, the division between who, what responsibility looks like, who's engaged, who's invested, and what the rationale might be for them to manage disease or not, 
probably sounds familiar. Um, and I'll say briefly here as an aside, but again, I'm a sociologist. I keep bees, I try to keep them disease free uh, or varroa free and then this um, relatedly. Um, but I do try mostly to reserve judgment. It's a funny kind of science, social science. It's not quite, again, the kind where you're dissecting small things, um, but, it is, um, but it is a science. And so we do try to, the, you, you ask questions a little bit separately. So it's a little bit of a separate question of who really is to blame or who really is responsible. I'm just saying right now, there's a narrative of who might be responsible kind of coming down from the highest of people on high, Everett Franklin Phillips, who says these little guys are screwing with our expert progressive, um, ex, uh, you know, qualified beekeepers. So again, to fast forward a hundred years, which is, um, this is why I'm not a real historian. I don't think they're allowed to do that in, uh, in real history. Um, again, there's something here about varroa mites. This is sort of the classic image, right? We're losing lots of bees broadly. It's kind of hard to count. Same way, same way the data from, from um, you know, a hundred years ago is kind of um, difficult to uh, trust 100%. The data here is kind of hard and we've got self-reported stuff and all these things, but we lose a lot of bees from year to year. Obviously it's mostly, well, I'd say obviously, lots of it um, comes from Varroa. Um, one way I like to think about this now, I read somewhere, I can't remember where anymore, that Varroa is like the fourth cast in the hive. Of course, we know our other castes, the queen, the workers, the drones, and then coming along with them are the, are the mites. Um, and so we have to manage them as well. Um, and so the thing, again, this is driving most of the mortality, the sort of expert scientific consensus seems to be that this is kind of the main, um, whether direct or indirect kind of vector of diseases. Um, and so again, it's been around for almost as long as I've been alive at this point uh, in the US. Um, and I have a quote here from the 1980s. I think I, I can't remember where I got it from. Um, one beekeeping extension agent suggested that these, these mites are welcome because the, mar it'll, um, the marginal beekeepers that cause most of the problems will inevitably be eliminated and they'll leave behind them a stronger and more vibrant beekeeping industry. Um, there's another scholar here that, that I read kind of in, um, in sociology world who talks about the ways that pests and diseases, and he doesn't name Varroa specifically, but I would, um, I would fill in a blank with that, that these diseases have accelerated the professionalization of beekeeping. Beekeeping is more laborious, more costly, more time consuming um, than it perhaps ever was. That's a hard comparison to make maybe, but um, it feels like it's an ever accelerating kind of treadmill for that. Um, and so I can't take credit for this, Wonderful image. I'm not going to try to play the video because, you know, the campus might go up in flames if I try. But you know, it's a video of these slow mo dogs, uh, slow mo video of these dogs shaking off um, gross stuff, you know, drying off, and their slobber is going everywhere. This is um, an image I saw from uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp again some years ago. Again, really to underscore the ways that Varroa is like the slobber, and if you've got what's often now called a mite bomb, you're potentially spreading it in this kind of gross, unsavory way, um, like these slow-mo dogs do. Um, and so again, there is, this is where the science becomes a little less uncertain. It's pretty much pinned down the kind of number one cause of mortality. It's a little bit less, um, there's some specifics and some caveats as I understand it, as it comes to mite bombs, this idea that a hive collapses and mites are kind of, um, uh, by Tom Seeley and one of his former students, um, where they suggest some slightly different nomenclature. The bomb is a little kind of too aggressive, but like a, I forget the word they um, the word they suggest instead. Um, but again, mites are, but they are contagious to a degree, and there's a sense that a lot of late summer, early fall losses among beekeepers who are otherwise staying on top of their ma mite management protocols are at the mercy of irresponsible, underinvested beekeepers who are kind of around them. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of name calling in both directions. So if commercial operators are accusing hobbyists of being irresponsible, I would say hobbyists and often the public more broadly, which are sort of more aligned, often find industrial scale beekeeping. That word always feels a little sort of like judgmental. 
in its own right, um, they find that problematic and responsible for elevated colony losses as well. Um, and so this, I mean, I think, again, if you've been keeping bees for five or more years, you're familiar with some of this language. Um, um, and again, kind of, yeah, asking people to be a good neighbor, being responsible beekeeping. Some of you might even recognize the, the font and color and know where these websites are, um, are coming from, depending on how closely you scour the blogs. Um, um, and so again, I'm, I'm uh, keeping, I don't have prescri a, pre a prescription of what to do. I don't think we need to go the way of Phillips and um, try to limit the number of small, small scale beekeepers. I wouldn't want to deny anyone the pleasures of beekeeping that I've enjoyed for these 10 years. Um, but there is something about doing it responsibly when there is a, um, a shared environment and that's the crux of environmental politics. There's a lot of things in the environment broadly defined in agriculture that are win-win and things are flexible. And there's other things where you simply have to make choices and not there, there are winners and losers and you have to sort of moderate your own activities um, in a shared commons. Um, so it's, yeah, I guess I'll, um, I'll end with a question. Then I have two more slides for kind of an additional provocation as we call it, kind of an additional thought. Um, but again, the question for, for the audience that I'd love to talk about, depending on how, whether there's a way to talk or if it's one of more me answering questions, but is again, as, as I would ask you to think about some of these ways that the history and the kind of um, what we see from the um, mid, 20, mid 19th and early 20th century, how that is um, reflected or how we see parallels in the present day um, um, and the ways that people talk about responsibility the ways that people talk about, quote, good, um, good beekeeping. That's a question I ask a lot when I'm doing interviews with beekeepers. It's a nice kind of open-ended one that can yield a lot of insights. What is good beekeeping? Um, they sort of start to spill the beans. Um, so that's one major piece. I tacked on a little extra piece at the end, um, just to be, again, just to add kind of one more provocation. And so this is another way for me about thinking about the divide or the politics within the beekeeping community broadly defined um, today. Um, if you're familiar, this is a mnemonic I see sometimes the four Ps are kind of the, the, the things that imperil bees the most. Um, oh, I just saw there was the chat. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, I see the chat, sorry, I didn't notice that before, but I'll go back to those later. Um, the four piece, um, so pesticides, pretty straightforward. Poor nutrition has more to do with sort of landscapes and the ways that um, forage might be lower in quality or lower in quantity um, or available at the wrong times of year, perhaps. Um, pathogens, um, broadly defined, again, I've talked about foul brood, but there's lots of other brood and other diseases. Uh, and parasites, my, my favorite picture of the Varroa there. And so, I think mnemonics are always great, um, but I think that there's something um, interesting sometimes if we actually think about dividing those into two different kinds of stressors. And so I've drawn a line here between the two, uh, or between two sets of two, and the line sort of corresponds with the picture below, and I'll explain that, um, which is that the ones on the top are the ones that bees are exposed to that kind of qualify as environmental pressures. I'm using words a little bit broadly, generally. Hopefully it's still a useful way to think about this, even if it's um, not always the most specific definition of something. But bees that fly wild, um, or all bees, all of our bees fly outside the hive. Um, and when they fly outside the hive, they might encounter pesticides on the landscapes, on the things they're bringing home, um, or they might not encounter the food they need um, of sufficient quality or quantity. And so that's something that beekeepers you know, despite, you know, unless you have a good relationship with a farmer or own land yourself, that's something that's largely out of beekeepers control. And for me, it's, well, and so it's, and it's about them being free flying. And that's pretty unusual for livestock. We don't, of course, cows can roam or maybe sheep can roam in the mountains of Montana a pretty far away, but there's still a relative amount of control kind of relative to these free flying insects. The other two, by contrast, are stressors that the bees face in their hives, um, perhaps as a function of apiculture itself, management practices, um, 
you could argue that some perhaps are inevitable at this point. If the mite is the fourth cast, then some degree of parasite pressure is perhaps inevitable. But there are things we can do um, uh, to manage and limit those kinds of um, exposures. And so that's more typical when we think about livestock, when we think about, you know, again, medicating our sheep or cows or, um, or kind of managing them much more closely. And I think that's something that's really fun and interesting and eternally fascinating about bees, and this is not a terribly new insight, um, is that they're, I mean, they're both. They're both wild and they're livestock. And I think that people who manage bees more, who know more about bees, tend to think of them as livestock. They tend to zoom in on those things that you can control. Um, they, you know, they get their grants from the USDA. Um, but the one, and the people who don't perhaps know as much in the popular imagination tend to put bees in the more environmental category. That said, I don't want to make it a breakdown of people who know more, know less and know more. Bees really are both. They're very much hybrid creatures that, um, again, are outside of some of these channels of control that we're, we're more used to having with, um, with the livestock that we manage. And so um, sometimes when I'm listening to somebody talk about bees and you know what's wrong with the bees these days i don't want to over um over interpret what they say but i can often learn a lot as to whether they're focusing on pesticides or whether they're focusing on the pathogens in their hives um, that kind of tells me sometimes about where i might um anticipate putting them and if they talk about all of them together i might think wow they're really on this like third plane that i'm trying to reach myself and to understand um how well you know again what i can control I think in my dissertation, I quote that, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, what I, the, you know, the serenity to, uh, no, I have to remember, the serenity to not control everything, you know, and <laughs> know the difference between them. Sometimes there's things we can do for our bees. Sometimes they aren't, there isn't, and they die. Uh, and it's important to know the difference. Um, and of course, to, to do as much as you can. But anyway, so those two things, again, the first part of the talk broadly is kind of this small scale, this degree of investment and the ways that that makes somebody perhaps disinvested in the health of their bees, according to some narratives. And then there's these other sense of devices about whether you think of free bees as free-flying wild creatures or whether you think of them as livestock, um, kind of broadly, and how that might situate you in a different, different side of the conversation. Um, so I will end there and turn it over to David to manage the Zoom pieces, I think. Michelle, really excellent. Uh presentation, lots of information there, Dr. Andrews. Um, there are a couple uh, questions in the Q&A, but I'm going to give folks uh, some a chance to, to type in some more so we can get a, a good bevy of questions for you. But I'll start out with one. And, and really, it, it's more of a rhetorical question, but something that I've always marveled at um, in the, the history of beekeeping, when you went over, you know, Moses Quimby and Hetherington and all, all these other, um, you know, kind of pillars of the golden age of, of, of beekeeping in the mid to late, you know, 1800s. One thing that I've always been fascinated about is that a lot of the novelty and inventions of the, you know, Langstroth movable uh, frame hive and, you know, the bellowed smoker and the 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 radial extractor and all these things they all depended on each other right so it you almost have this kind of chicken and egg thing i mean i suppose the the movable frame hive is separate from the smoker but they really couldn't all work together unless you had all of them at the same time but they were all invented or, or maybe you know this, um, were they communicating with each other or were they all invented kind of in parallel and it was just kind of this confluence of thought where it all came together at the same time? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't have all the, again, a real historian would bring out the archives, which I don't always um, know how to navigate. But yeah, the short answer is yes, people were very much in contact with one another. The beekeeping magazines are just amazing. Um, and the kinds of, yeah, the kinds of just back and forth all the time that people were um, were were doing. And I think it's a, that's true of agriculture broadly, just this, this was a kind of growing professional and social um, circle. This is a moment 
the U.S. becomes majority urban right around 1920, I think. So at that time, most people are still rural and um, sort of, again, eking out these livelihoods in ways that for most right. of us, for many of us, many of us here in the East, especially, is um, no longer quite as relevant. Um, but I, and the first question, or the first part of your question is a fun one for me because there's a word that, again, I wouldn't normally use um, uh, or that I use in my sort of scholarly stuff when I'm talking to specific people, but that whole collection, the chicken and egg and everything else, we call an envirotechnical enviro regime. And so the way, the thing is at all, I can like type that in the chat or something. I, <laughs> love, right. I love it. Envirotechnical yeah. regime. Envirotechnical <laughs> regime. I mean, I don't know that jargon is always useful, but if that's a two words way of saying a sentence at least. So sometimes we do that, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, and so, yeah, everything is tied together. Yeah, you, the smoker has to do with the way that you're pulling out honey instead of just killing the bees and the, you know, extractor. I mean, all these pieces. And together they find not everything has coherence. It's really fun sometimes to look at the inventions that like didn't make it um, or that um, I see early prototypes. I can't think of any inventions that, but there, I mean, there's a bunch of lots of things that sort of didn't, didn't stand the test of time, so to speak. Um, um, but the ones that remain have this kind of coherence. And there's also this, again, political, social, institutional, um, support behind them and this is true not only in beekeeping but again in farming with grain drills and you know improved seed and this and that and certain landscapes um that so there's some variation across landscapes and then there's also um a more general regime that's the usda and in our case the bureau of entomology and um these actors um you know cornell getting money from the state and all these things um that work together in a way that's a bit of a Rube Goldberg, but it works kind of. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I'm definitely going to have to com uh, commit that term to memory. So thank thanks for that. Um, so Anthony here asks, uh, kind of on your last slide there with that 4P diagram, uh, where does beekeeper mismanagement fall on that? Yeah, here, I'll share it again here. Um, so I would say, yeah, beekeeper mismanagement or management in general would be in this bottom half, mostly in the sense that it's somebody who's, again, not managing their, their varroa or other pieces, um, or they're not, yeah, their nosema to the degree that needs to be managed. Um, but a really excellent form of management is taking all of these into account. And again, that's what's so, for me, what's so um, re like a renew, a kind of a renewed excitement every year. It's not like a, it's, you're, you're beating your own PR as like a runner, you know, you're doing, you're getting better yourself, but you're always in conversation with the environment as well. It's kind of a funny way to put it, but you're, you know, you're always responding to different conditions and that's why it's not just um, figuring out your best pollen substitute once and for all and you know calling it good or something. Um, but in general, I would put management in this bottom, what we think of as management in this bottom half, whereas what we think of as more, um, um, yeah, the kind of knowledge and attention that, um, that is interfacing with environmental conditions. I put that more at the um, at the top. Um, one thing that I think is really exciting and that I've, I've been doing some research on, I guess not exactly with you, but um, adjacent to some of the work that you and I have talked about is genetics. I think genetics is a really, when people talk about improving the bee, uh, especially against something like Varroa, that's taking all of these into account when you talk about a winter bee or something that else kind of do well in New York. It's you're trying to find something that that is um, subject to control, but also can kind of handle its own when it comes to this, these environmental conditions. Right, right, right. Um, so DW here has a question or an observation really, which I think is quite insightful and really good for discussion here. And saying that there hasn't been a single case where livestock has really been bred to reject an external parasite. So not kind of an internal thing, but an, ex, an exo parasite. So why do beekeepers keep holding out hope that you know the only good mite is a dead mite, and that we're going to somehow rid ourselves of varroa. 
Yeah, no, I see that kind of the two parts there. There's something about breathing, which again, I, I was just talking about and I can mention. And then there's something about living with Varroa, which is kind of another one. So yeah, I do think that breathing is this funny thing. It's, it's if you look at the claims with any kind of skepticism, it's like, how are people pretending that, that you're like these magic bees? I mean, that's one, I have a, a, an article under construction called uh, Magic Bees and Mutts. These are kind of the two discourses people use to talk about strong, good bees, the ones that are bred exactly from Russia and Louisiana, and or the ones that are somehow also magically just came from the forest and also survived and um, will therefore do well uh, in your particular locale. And so I think, yeah, there is a lot of unfounded optimism about the degree to which breeding can help. And again, I am not a geneticist I, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, however, looking at some, you, can, you can look at claims about one thing and look at claims about another and think, wow, they're really taking the same tone of like, the electric car is gonna solve it all and so are the magic bees. Um, as to the other part of the question, yeah, I think that, I, don't, I mean, it does seem like Varroa is something that has to be lived with, and I don't have a lot of cases in other animals, but it does seem like it just becomes a part of the, um, you know, you write, you figure out your seasonal calendar, and that includes the management, and again, I, that's my only experience keeping bees, and I, I love hearing stories about people who um, got to get, um, get in on earlier than that and um, got to raise bees without that. But yeah. it does seem like they're here. <laughs> yeah, starting to become fewer and fewer, I'm afraid, too. Um, so uh, Anthony, again, that's, that's another question to go back to kind of the historical, the first part of your talk there, um, and brought up uh, a pa the parallelism of similar innovation and development of beekeeping equipment, hive equipment, whatnot, in Europe. Um, I know that, you know, everybody here on this side of the Atlantic said, you know, who invented the, you know, the bee space, you know, uh, um, brood or a, a beehive, and that's going to be uh, Lorenzo Langstroth. You go over to the other side of the Atlantic, it's Johannes Zertsen, right, <laughs> who pretty much invented it exactly the same time, and it's possible one of them might have ripped it off from the other. Um, so, you know, can you comment on that or, or have you kind of delved into the parallelisms of in, in Europe at all? Yeah, I haven't delved in too deeply, but I certainly know they're out there. There's a wonderful dissertation um, by, uh, I won't remember his name, but if anybody wants to know, I can look it up. Um, kind of looking at, um, actually pertaining to your initial question about the ways that all of this kind of talking was happening. And that was more, for him, the dissertation is more about what's happening in England at the time. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's these. There are very much parallel processes. Um, certainly, differences to be teased out in terms of, you know, the landscapes and um, and then today, of course, beekeeping looks pretty different at the commercial scale. Um, I think um, at sort of the highest scale. Um, but yeah, there's. Um, but I, but I've noticed that before. There's just a different hero on um, over there, which is I think is pretty funny. Yeah. No. Exactly. I've always marveled at that too. Um, so I'll, I'll ask another question since you kind of brought it up in this, um, the, the, the history of, of the, the bimodal, what today we call the hobbyist versus the commercial or, you know, um, the, the, the real term that we've been trying to use in extension is part-time and full-time beekeepers, right? But we know that that's also more of a continuum um, but I always thought that beekeeping was very unique when it comes to that. We know that 90% of the beekeepers own 10% of the hives and 10% of the beekeepers own 90% of the hives. And that kind of bimodality of those two populations and opposite populations really dictate a lot of the dynamics that you were just talking about. But when, when I was talking about that to a, a room full of veterinarians, I was very quickly corrected by saying that most other kind of at least livestock systems in the US follow pr practically the same pattern. <laughs> you know, that most people who own cows only have one or two cows, but yeah, you do have these factory farms with 10,000 cows, right? And so, you know, it's, you have that same pattern almost in, in a lot of these other systems.
which I found very, very interesting. So how, how, does, how does that dynamic perhaps translate to some of these other agricultural ventures? Yeah, I can't, um, I can't speak to other animal, animal husbandry per se, although I have um, I've raised geese and my sister raises cows and so we're all kind of, um, you know, knee deep in various things. But um, the, the analogy that I always think of is sort of gardening versus farming. And in that case, we tend to use slightly different words. I mean, I grow a pretty big potato patch. I grow a lot of, you know, too many tomatoes but I just call it gardening. And so it sort of just renders it as something else something different than the dairy farmers and the guys who have the soy and the alfalfa kind of right outside, like literally just outside my garden fence. Um, um, and it just, so it just, and again, that's partly a full-time part-time thing is the distinction that you've made there. But for me, just even the language, maybe we would, we would call it something like, I mean, there's cynical people who call it bee having versus beekeeping or something that's a little different, but um, I don't know, apiculture versus beekeeping maybe could be a way that we that we render that distinction. And then we wouldn't expect them to be at the same meetings with the same priorities, with the same, um, you know, things they're asking their legislators for. So, right. Uh, can, exactly. can I jump in with a quick question because I can't write one on the Q and A as a panelist. Um, so, uh, following on that one, Montana is a unique state in that. For over 100 years, Montana has a bee act that requires a free mile buffer zone between every registered apiary, and there's close to 6,000 registered apiaries in the state. Now, hobbyists can sit closer. Uh, they had to do that, or else the hobbyists would have made sure that the whole bee act went away and so on. There are three other states that have something similar, but we're the only one that I know that has had that continuity and has that really rigid free mile apart if they're owned by different people type of thing. And early on, that was because of foul brood. Then it became more of an economic business model. Then with CCD and, and so on, we saw that it actually played out and we could see some of the impacts of that on who got what and so on. New York, on the other hand, has a checkered history with their bee inspectors that continue to this day and so on. Virtually, in many times, New York has no functional one, as do many of the states. I think there are only 13 apiculture inspectors. When I first started, every state had one and so on. So how does that factor into all this? Yeah, yeah, no, and that's, I'll, I'll add in um, Skip's question here from the chat and, and, and not do either of them justice, I guess, at the same time, which is to say that, yeah, the bee laws are su such a crazy patchwork. They're so um, beholden to these funny legacies. You know, somebody came into office in the 60s and did some good work or not, and now it all looks totally different um, from place to place. And so, yeah, again, there's efforts right now that there are no laws that would do anything around Varroa in New York, but there's people saying, well, this, this would be a reason of like this, this needs to be updated and we need this. We could put those two together and just kind of update this whole law. I don't think from what I understand, there would be any hope of a, a buffer zone kind of radius um, here. I mean, but also we're a little tighter squeeze than you are in Montana. Um, I should say my family, but my family and in-laws are all in Montana, but and I'll be moving to Colorado soon. So I'll learn, and I think Colorado has actually some different groups going on, which will be interesting. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is the laws are super dysfunctional. Um, and that is, um, again, there's political science governance and all these other pieces that um, make it so about so much more than what we might think of as rational disease control. Um, it's just about, everything else under the, or it can be about everything else under the sun. I'm sure Kentucky has it all figured out. I should say that too, but. <laughs> oh no, oh no, <laughs> not even. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know if you're working on it, but, or who's, um, yeah, who's in, who's in charge, but that's, that's the thing is that of course nobody is in, really in charge of anything. That's part of the regime thing is that some of these systems keep on spinning after you've um, stopped, you know. Um, well, in, in many ways, Ellie, I think this is why you and Tammy and, and others working in this space, right, that is kind of the sociological side to the industry, to research, to the biology, to the science, um, I think is way more impactful and way more necessary. I mean, how many more research studies do we need to say Varroa is not healthy for your colonies? You know, like, I mean, we don't need that. We don't need to convince everybody that you know varroa is you know something that um, beekeepers need to 
at least recognize is is a thing um you know but what to actually do about it and how to actually harness that and channel everybody in the same direction so that we can solve these grand problems i think is is really uh important mm -hmm. um so uh i think um let's see see a couple other oh sorry yes i do see some other comment or uh, questions here um I'll, I'll move to angela um NCAT is now teaching that the barber pole worm is becoming resistant to antiparasitic medicine. Their new directive is to cull susceptible sheep and to propagate already resistant sheep to the worm. So if we're going to refer to livestock and the precedent of them, then allowing non-mite resistant stock to die out would need to be revisited at some point in the future. Um, even if it topples bee dependent crops, a question mark. <laughs> um, so, so I guess let's, let's run that thought experiment, right? That we just let live and let die and let all bees, you know, honeybees die off from Varroa. Whatever's left over we breed from and now all of a sudden we don't have a Varroa problem. Of course, meanwhile, we won't have any many fruits and vegetables, <laughs> not nearly as many, at least grown in the US. Um, is that uh, is that a good way to go? Is that is that something that could be legislated? Is that something that could even work? Well, well there's maybe another difference between the U.S. and Europe. <laughs> Nothing like that is going to pass here. I don't know if it would pass there or not. Um, but yeah, I think absolutely these questions of breeding and genetics are questions of values and economies and. Um, uh, yeah, the, maybe the regard that you hold certain rural livelihoods in. I mean, that's not to say that people are necessarily dismissive either, but but it's um, whether or not it can happen is or whether or not sort of the genetics could work in such a way that you get um, sort of mite resistant stock at the end has rather less to do with it than the kinds of interests that, are, that would go into a certain um, way of a collective management of bee stocks to get there. And so again, I teach the sociology of sustainability. My question with my students is like, it's not the solar panel, like the question in this class is not the solar panel technology. It's, it's the tax credits, it's the politics, it's the parties, it's yep. the, um, yep. the, you know, using less consumption patterns, social norms, all of that. And so to me, that's very parallel um, in terms of mm -hmm. how we might collectively steer bee genetics. Yeah, it's interesting kind of from the population genetics perspective and from kind of the evolutionary biology perspective that I would come from, I would say, well, nothing works, you know, there's a very powerful force, natural selection. The problem, though, with that type of um, potential is that all it takes is for the Varroa to slightly adapt. And now all of the supposed resistant ones are now no longer resistant. You always have this evolutionary arms race. And so it really is kind of an outstanding question of whether you can win that evolutionary arms race in, in that type of system. So I, I, I know that you can um, work towards a stalemate in those types of things, right? But to, to actually kind of win so that it's no longer an issue, I think is actually, um, you know, a, a fleeting and, and perhaps, uh, difficult, if not impossible, endpoint to, to result in. So, but yeah, your point is well taken that practically, I think it that's um, a thought experiment is about as far as one could get with that, is unfortunately. Well, and I love that word stalemate. It's like, that's not going to work for a political slogan or for your next right. like, <laughs> USDA grant, like right. aiming for a stalemate. Like, that's not the usual. Yes. <laughs> Let's end this. in a tie and everybody wins. Yeah, no, you're right. Exactly right. 